that night when the data was unblinded and we could see for the first time mm-hmm. what the results were, I was on my knees. I was so overwhelmed mm-hmm. uh, with gratitude, answers to prayer. I was supposed to speak. I couldn't. I just cried. From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Clarissa Mall, producer and moderator of The Bulletin. What if some of your biggest life decisions affected millions of people? Such is the case with Dr. Francis Collins, former director of the National Institutes of Health during the COVID-19 pandemic. In his new book, The Road to Wisdom, on truth, science, faith, and trust, Dr. Collins reflects on a lifetime of service in the scientific community. Service that included directing the mapping of the human genome, and yes, guiding Americans through the worst pandemic in modern history. Today, Mike Cosper sits down with Dr. Collins for a profoundly intimate interview about COVID, the scientific method, the polarization that so often favors tribal alliances over love of neighbor, and the unlikely honor of admitting your mistakes. Whatever you thought about COVID before, you're bound to learn something new here today. Welcome to the show. Francis Collins, welcome to the book. I'm glad to join you. Your new book is called The Road to Wisdom. What are you inviting us into when you talk about the road to wisdom? Yeah, it's a word that's been around a while. And for Christians, uh, you want to go and read the book of Proverbs for starters, because almost all of it is about wisdom. But what exactly is it? It's not the same as knowledge, although it depends on knowledge. But it adds to that uh, moral judgments, the discernment about the appropriate path to take when it isn't quite clear, just Mm -hmm. based on the evidence. So it's a sophisticated version Mm -hmm. of humanity's effort to try to make sense out of a complicated world and to do so lovingly and with a good sense of morality. For a significant part of the book, you talk about the knowledge problem that we're facing right now as a culture. Mm -hmm. You frame it in a way that I think appropriately kind of identifies that we have a polarization problem, but we also have a knowledge problem at each end of the polarized spectrum. So on the left, you have this deconstruction of knowledge. All knowledge is contextual. All knowledge is... um, Postmodernism. Yeah. And then on the right, you have this profound sort of institutional distrust. I'm really troubled about the state of our society, and that includes the Christian church, that we seem to be at a point of really severe divisiveness and polarization about almost everything, Mm. even to the point of disagreeing about things that seem to be established facts, but people may not like the facts. And so Mm. there's a willingness to set them aside for something that you prefer. This has all been contaminated, of course, by all the many sources of information that come at us that are really not based on evidence, Mm. uh, but seem compelling at the time and have driven us in many ways to be angry about things and fearful about things, probably out of proportion Mm -hmm. to what the real situation would require. We're supposed to be people of love. You know that hymn, they know we are Christians by our love. Mm -hmm. That's not what the world is seeing right now. Even though I think people sitting in the pews on Sunday are people of love, but What's coming across so much is controversy, anger, recriminations, even hypocrisy. Mm. And that is just so hurtful uh, to see. For me as a Christian who's also a scientist, it's been really troubling to see that one of the consequences of all of this disillusionment and distrust about everything has included science. That. I'm a scientist who sees science as God's gift, giving us a chance to learn about God's creation. That's what you're doing with science, Mm -hmm. is you're exploring what God has given us. And for that to be a source of controversy or disagreement in terms of whether science is actually a good thing, seems Mm -hmm. troubling, to put it mildly. And for people to begin to distrust science because they assume that scientists are all atheists who are out to destroy faith. Well, 
actually about 40% of us are believers. You come to this from such an interesting vantage point. I was thinking about your story. You tell a lot of your story in the book. I've been familiar with your work. I read The Language of God years ago mm -hmm. and loved it. And I can point to at least three people that I know pretty well in my life who became believers or renewed their faith because of your book, mm -hmm. because of The Language of God. Two of them were medical doctors that were in med school wrestling with ethical questions and other things and picked up your book and it was, mm. you know, life changing. Mm. So you occupied this interesting place where like five years ago, 10 years ago, people primarily knew you as affiliated with the Human Genome Project. And then Christians who knew about you knew you because you were part of this dialogue about science and faith. Mm -hmm. You had some dialogues with atheists during the new atheist thing. Mm -hmm. But now you are known because of your work at the NIH, your leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. which is a completely different way to be situated in relation to the church. What's that journey been like for you personally? It's puzzling that it is seen as such a different mm -hmm. perspective because for me as a scientist who wanted to use science's gifts uh, to try to alleviate suffering and save lives, COVID-19 came along as a huge challenge to see, could we actually do that? Mm. And the work that got started in the early days of 2020 to try to develop therapeutics and diagnostic tests and vaccines was just an amazing enterprise that involved hundreds of scientists from the private and the public sectors, from the government, from universities, all working 100-hour weeks selflessly, not worrying about who was going to get the credit, just trying to do something to stop this terrible tragedy that was all around us. People had kind of forgotten how bad it was in mm -hmm. those early months of 2020 when the morgues were overflowing, so you had to have trucks pulled up outside the hospital to handle all the dead bodies, and 4,000 people dying every day, and we had nothing at that point. Mm -hmm that could really be offered to turn that around. And every day felt like a crisis of we've got to do everything possibly scientifically. For me, as a person of faith, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, this is like a calling, okay, mm -hmm. you must pray about this as I did many times a day. And you must also try to bring all of the ideas that could possibly help on the table and push them forward. And we made mistakes all the way along. I think people were gradually getting disillusioned about some of the public health recommendations, whether it was masking or social distancing or the need to close businesses or schools. Many of those made sense at the beginning when we really didn't know what we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. That's something we didn't do a good job of, is explaining how the data about SARS-CoV-2 was very incomplete mm -hmm. at the beginning and, and stayed pretty incomplete for quite a while. And yet you had to do what you could to stop the terrible loss of life. So it made sense to do things to, as we said at the time, flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Flatten the curve didn't mean we necessarily were going to stop the disease in its tracks, but we're going to spread it out enough so the hospitals would not be completely overwhelmed, which they were very close to, mm -hmm. especially in urban settings. But some of those restrictions went on then much longer than they should have, and people yeah. got frustrated, and I totally get that. But again, I, I felt like this is why I'm here. This is what I'm supposed to be doing, and let me do everything I can also to link up with leaders in the church to hear what's happening, to try to convey what I think were the best facts that we had about the virus and what to do to save lives. And mm -hmm. certainly a lot of that was to develop this vaccine, which right. was our best hope, a hope that ultimately paid off in the development of safe and effective vaccines in 11 months, which is at least five times faster than had ever been possible before, and which is now the reason that we saved about 3 million lives in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that's not my data, that's a Commonwealth Fund. Yeah. I started at CT in February, the executive producer of the Bulletin, Eric Petrick. He was starting right then as well. And the first time we got together, we had like a quarterly all staff gathering in Chicago on March 10th through the 13th or 11th through the 13th or something like that. Mm -hmm. And right then. And it was mm -hmm. the first day of the shutdown, was mm -hmm. the day I flew home. I'll never forget 
flying home through O'Hare that night, and it was a ghost town. I've never mm-hmm. seen anything like it. It was like something out of a movie. Like right. you're maybe a dozen, two dozen people in there, all the way from security to the gates. There were like five of us on the plane. The only reason they didn't cancel the flight was because it was a Louisville-based crew, and so they had to take them second time anyway. Oh. And you know, and we were like, oh, this is gonna be a couple of weeks, and you know, we'll be together. I didn't see those CT people in person again for over a year, I think was the next time we were all together. Because mm-hmm. nobody knew what was coming and nobody knew what was or what was safe. What was gonna happen. Yeah. When did you know it was gonna be bad? Yeah, it would have been January twenty four, twenty five, something like that of twenty twenty. I was one of the people at the World Economic Forum talking about medicine and science and the head of the World Health Organization was there and all the people who were collecting data about what was happening in other parts of the world and a little bit of what was going on in China, although it was still being pretty much hidden. And you could just see from the evidence, this is going to be the big one. This is not going to be containable. Hmm. Uh, This is going to find its way into every nook and cranny of our planet. Hmm. And it sounds like it is a particularly infectious and a particularly lethal disease. And this is a coronavirus. This is not influenza. We know a little bit about this because of SARS and MERS, but we're going to have to do everything at record speed mm. to try to see what we could do to stop this from taking even many more millions of lives than it did. And it took way too many. So one of the things you talk about in the book that I, I think is fascinating to kind of to read through, because there's a lot you forget. In fact, I think I think the forgetting is fascinating. The, yeah. the fact that we as a culture kind of forget. It's and, a bit of a mental self-defense, I suppose. You well, don't want to dwell on just how awful it was. It's too hard. I've heard a number of people comment on it in reference to the Spanish flu, mm-hmm. which was similarly devastating and, you know, enormous death tolls, horrible deaths. And you, you have to imagine the sort of the state of medicine at the time and everything too, like how intimately everyone even experienced that. Right. Right? But people, when it ended, people didn't want to talk about it. And you don't find people talking about it. There's not literature. There's not, you know, Spanish flu novels. And, right. like, you know, it's like, put it behind us, tell a different story, and move on. And I wonder if that's not what we're seeing with this. I think we are seeing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people would just prefer not to talk about it anymore yeah. and, and to say, okay, that's in the past. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is still out there. Fortunately, now most people have some immunity, either from vaccines, I just got my seventh booster, (laughs) uh, or from having had the illness. So the death rate and the hospitalization rate uh, is a fraction of what it was, but it's not gone. So you talk a bit in the book, you talk about... It was a perfect storm. As I, as I was reading it, I was making notes to myself, and I, I was thinking, you have this crisis, and there's already kind of a culture of mistrust. Mm-hmm. There were lots of sources of misinformation. There were times where mistakes were made in terms of guidance that turned out to be wrong and corrected later. For instance, the masking. I thought masking was really interesting. You deal with that directly. What happened with masking, and why did that become the sort of bugaboo that did? Yeah, it's unfortunate that that was one of the main places where people began to wonder whether they could trust the public health. Even though what was done scientifically made sense, it wasn't apparently explained effectively. Initially, when it was clear that this disease was spreading across the world, uh, the question was, do people need to wear masks all the time? The model we had for this disease were the other two coronaviruses that had caused trouble in the preceding 20 years, SARS, which was 2003, and MERS, which was 2016. Those were related viruses, but for those diseases to be infectious, you had to be really sick. So we kind of assumed if you're feeling okay, you're probably not a risk to anybody, and so not necessary to put masks on. There was a shortage, to be sure, so let's save the masks Mm -hmm. for the people in the hospitals. But then, over the course of only a month or so, it began to become clear that there were lots of people who were incubating this virus. Maybe they were going to get sick three days later, but they were wildly infectious now. Mm. And if you had any chance of stopping the spread, 
then we basically had to assume everybody's infectious all the time because some are going to be mm -hmm. and ask people to put on the mask. Mm -hmm. But that seemed like the biggest flip flop. Right. Despite, I think, the efforts uh, by the CDC, by the Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, to try to explain why the change was made, I don't think it got mm -hmm. clearly enough into people's minds that this actually was science and mm -hmm. not just being jerked around. When I read that, I thought back, and the narrative that was in my head, and who knows where this came from for me, <laughs> but the narrative that had been in my head was you had heard people say, well, the reason that we asked people not to mask is because... We had a shortage of the, the equipment and we needed to prioritize first responders and doctors. Not that the data had mm. been updated. Even as I'm reading the book and thinking through it, I'm going, well, I didn't get that story. That is what a lot of people apparently heard. Mm -hmm. That was not the main motivation for the original recommendation that masks aren't necessary. We thought they weren't. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you were having symptoms, right. uh, you were not somebody who was going to infect somebody else. And then we found out that wasn't yeah. true. Part of what I think is helpful about the book is you talk about science and you describe kind of the process. Like the science is a process. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> because what I think people think is you heard it mocked over and over again by critics of you, critics of, of Dr. Fauci. People say, well, they keep saying trust the science and it keeps changing. <laughs> and it's like, that's what science is. It's yeah. you're just you're, the disease is changing. Our knowledge of the disease is. Talk about that a bit, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to make leadership decisions and give people direction, but the information you have to work with is changing all the time. Exactly. In retrospect, this might have been a wonderful opportunity to teach about the scientific method, because this is exactly <laughs> what was going on. You started out with a crisis and very incomplete information. And you kind of generate a hypothesis, and then you try to collect more data to see if your hypothesis is right. Maybe the hypothesis is people with no symptoms are not infectious. Don't worry about them. Mm -hmm. And then you collect more data and you realize, well, gosh, those five people there got really sick and they were only exposed to healthy people. Something's not right here. Mm -hmm. So all the way along, we're kind of trying to build the information base about SARS-CoV-2, starting from something quite rudimentary mm -hmm. and finding some surprises along the way. Like, oh, this virus is not going to stay constant. It's going to evolve. Mm -hmm. And that means we're almost starting over again with this next thing like Omicron that's so different that a lot of the rules we thought we had for mm -hmm. the original virus don't quite apply anymore. I mean, it's a wonderful lesson in how science responds to the gathering of data, but it didn't feel that way mm -hmm. to people who kept thinking, these guys don't know what they're talking about, or right. worse, they're actually intentionally manipulating us, right. which right. was never the case. Let me just say, of all the people I worked with, and these were incredibly intense months and more than a year, I never saw anybody who was trying to do anything other than the best they could to try right. to understand this and try to save lives. Right. And it is troubling uh, to have implications made or assumptions thrown out casually. Uh, well, these people were all on the take. Mm -hmm. They basically had all kinds of other motivations and not what was best for the public. That was simply not true. Mm -hmm. Another one of the ways that that narrative has emerged is the way people talk about the lab leak theory, right? I guess it was February of 2020, there was a paper that was published that said, we've looked at this thing, we've looked at the DNA, this does not look lab engineered, is essentially what the, the article right. says, very, correct? Very, important that you phrase it that way. Because the paper does not say it couldn't have come from a lab, it's saying it wasn't man-made, which is, which is a distinct a Really difference. important distinction, Mike, I'm glad you're bringing this up, because I think a lot of confusion has reigned about, what do you mean when you say lab leak? Mm -hmm. That paper, written by the world's most experts, virologists who could study the sequence of the letters of the code of SARS-CoV-2 and infer what its likely origin was, was all about that question. Could this have been engineered from scratch uh, by some evil scientist who wanted to make something that was going to spread across the world and kill a lot of people? And when you looked at the letters of the code, and they very seriously started out saying, let's have our hypothesis be this is human engineered and let's see if it holds up. Mm -hmm. It didn't. You could not see how this could have possibly been constructed 
because it broke all the rules about what we knew about coronaviruses. Looking at those letters, you would have said, this will never work. This won't infect anybody. But it did because mm. it had new features that had never really been seen before. So they were simply arguing, let's not say that this was designed, manufactured in a lab somewhere and turned mm -hmm. loose. They did not say that it couldn't have been naturally occurring and then secretly under study mm -hmm. in a lab somewhere where there was a leak. We can't say today that that did not happen. So gain-of-function research is where you take a disease found in the wild and you play with it, right? You doctor it in the lab to various effects. One of the theories has been like the Wuhan lab was doing gain-of-function research on other viruses. When you say that you look at this and you say it wouldn't have been a designer disease, could it have been a gain-of-function disease? We'd still have to start with something that happened naturally. Right. Can I say categorically that that might then have been brought into the lab secretly? Let me be absolutely clear. That kind of gain-of-function research is specifically prohibited by any U.S. funds in a very clear policy. But Wuhan Institute of Virology has lots of other sources of support from the Chinese government. Right. So could they have been then trying uh, to passage this virus uh, through cell culture or mice or something to see if it could gain some additional function? I can't exclude that. On the mm -hmm. other hand, there's absolutely no data to support that. Mm -hmm. If I had to place my bets, first I would say this was a naturally occurring virus to begin with. There is some chance that there was human manipulation of the virus or maybe just growing it in the lab and it got loose, but there's no data to support that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's very compelling data, which has gotten a lot less attention, that the first cases happened in a particular corner of the Wuhan wet market, right at the place where wild animals were being butchered, mm -hmm. including raccoon dogs, which we know are a natural host for SARS-CoV-2. And there are swabs taken there in January of 2020, where you have DNA from the virus and a raccoon dog in the same swab. Mm -hmm. That doesn't prove that that was the source. But if you want to take Occam's razor, you know, Occam's razor, where you have a confusing situation and right. you say, which of these things makes the most simple sense? Mm -hmm. For me, the most simple sense is this was naturally occurring. It was in a bat. It got into an intermediate host, maybe the raccoon dog. All this butchering was going on, which was not supposed to be happening in, mm -hmm. in this wet market. And one of those animals, or maybe several of them, were infected with this virus. And the people around them acquired it. And that's why the first cases happened there. And then it spread like what? But I think this is an interesting juncture to talk about something else in the book, which yeah. is how do we arrive at a different kind of conclusion about something like this based on our own pre-existing web of belief. Mm -hmm. My web of belief, think about it as a spider web. <laughs> and spider webs have threads, and then they have nodes where the threads overlap each other. In the center of a circular spider web are the nodes that are really important for the whole thing holding together. Our belief system can kind of be thought about that way. So what's in that central node? My central node has that my wife loves me. I have no evidence to the contrary and hope I won't <laughs> discover any. Uh, it has uh, that Jesus died for me. That's critical to who I am and that Jesus literally rose from the dead. But also in there is that science is a valid way to discover truth about nature. Right. So when I see all this data coming at me about this virus and how it got started, I'm kind of attaching myself to that node and saying, okay, put aside any of my other kinds of suspicions or biases. The science, plain and simple, and I think this would be true of most scientists, would say, this is most likely a naturally occurring virus. There was no mischief involved in, in a lab leak, but I can't exclude it. And I'll mm -hmm. change my mind if you give me that data. Whereas if somebody else comes in where one of their central nodes is, the government has been misleading us, mm -hmm. uh, has been hiding facts, has been up to stuff that they don't want to admit, then this information lands in that place and you hear something about gain of function and mm -hmm. something about this Wuhan Institute of Virology and it seems like, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. There's actually truth in there somewhere sure. <laughs> and sure. the truth doesn't care how we feel about it, which is 
not necessarily something we all want to hear when it's a particular fact that we're uncomfortable with. Facts don't care how you feel. In this case, we don't have all the facts, right. but the most likely some of the facts is that this was a natural event. One of the memes that went around during all of this is that, you know, 2020 was the year we all became epidemiologists. Right? <laughs> well, um, do it yourself, to <laughs> epidemiologists. Yeah, exactly. Because, <laughs> because the reality is when, when you talk about the data that you're looking at, there's a whole language in the data that you're looking at and reading and interpreting that would mean nothing to 99.9% .9 of our listeners here, right? Mm -hmm. This is something you talk about quite a bit in the book is we are in this interesting moment where there's this proliferation of media and you can kind of curate your own media silo where it's always going to affirm what you think, except when you go onto certain parts of social media, you're not going there to be exposed to other ideas. That's just for combat, right? Like that's just to go spar with the people you disagree with mm. and then go back to your corner and with the people who agree with you all the time. It feeds the polarization, yes. but it also makes for a moment where it's like, when the country was in trouble, we needed clarity and we needed leadership. You had this lack of confidence in experts and really a lack of even like a, a coherent agreement about who are the experts that we should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned in the book, you know, one of the most infamous moments in all of COVID is, was when President Trump went on television and said, you know, we're looking at things like light or injecting bleach, you know, <laughs> stuff that was just completely wild and crazy. But there were other things that, beyond the president, there were other things that caught on to the national imagination in other ways. We'll talk about the vaccine in a minute, but even the way people started telling ivermectin stories. In certain circles, certain silos, everybody's trying to go get ivermectin. Oh, yeah. How did we arrive at this place where we don't trust experts, where your credentials meant nothing to so many people, mm -hmm. and Joe Rogan's meant everything? And it wasn't just that mine meant nothing. They were actually seen as a negative. Yeah. Uh, that's one of those elitists uh, that's trying to tell us all what to do. I guess this brings us to the whole topic of trust and how do we make a decision about who to trust? Because I think that has gotten skewed. And we, we, we could certainly say that trust in institutions and individuals has taken a steep downturn mm -hmm. across the board in the last five or six years. Some of that is earned by bad behavior, mm -hmm. but some of it is manufactured. Distrust that gets hmm. attached to a particular institution because somebody is spreading stories that don't happen to be true. Mm -hmm. And we have to be careful about that. I sort of think of how we decide whether to trust somebody or some institution has four components. First of all, competence. Does this individual have credentials that would lead you to believe they've really studied this issue mm -hmm. and they really know all the pros and cons. Uh, even that these days sometimes gets overlooked. If it's a posting on Facebook that just made you mad, mm -hmm. even though I don't know who this person is, I'm going to pass this on to everybody else because yeah. it must be true. Okay. Competence got to be better about that. Second is integrity. Is this a source that has a track record of being honest? both about what they've done before and if they've made a mistake, have they said so. Third is humility, uh, recognition that experts are expert in a particular domain, but not in everything. Mm -hmm. So when the celebrity tells you what you should be doing about your diet, well, think about that one. <laughs> Does that person right. actually know anything about your diet? Those are three, but then the big one right now is does this source have aligned values with me? And that one has loomed larger and larger as we've gotten more and more polarized. And so if you're suspicious of the government based on the way in which COVID was handled, and again, I will say plenty of things did not go right there. Mm -hmm. And then the government comes along and says, actually, this looks like a naturally occurring virus. You're gonna, pff, of course they would say that. Right. Even if what they're showing you is evidence. So. That aligned value thing is also a cognitive bias. Mm. And when cognitive bias gets to be so strong that it actually tilts your judgment about who to trust and who not to trust, then we really are losing an anchor that matters a lot. And if what we're doing is trying to get on this road to wisdom, which is where we started talking about, it, it's hard to get to wisdom if your knowledge base is all contaminated with things 
that you shouldn't have trusted. And also it's missing things that were true, but you rejected because mm -hmm. it didn't align with your values. What creates that situation? Mm -hmm. Like how did we arrive at a point where your sort of tribal affiliation yeah. is more important than your competencies, your credentials, oh, your... Indeed. Yeah, it didn't start with COVID, but COVID I think played into it in unfortunate ways. Uh, the sociologists would say we have been getting progressively more divided, mostly over political issues uh, mm -hmm. for at least two or three decades. And the rhetoric has become progressively more inflammatory. Uh, and the interest in finding common ground has been harder and harder to find mm -hmm. because politics become a blood sport. Yeah. And if you look at the level of polarization of the country, it's pretty bad. But if you look at the level of polarization in the Congress, it's even worse. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to see us brought back together by our elected representatives, at least right now. Yeah. It seems to be going the other way. So all of that background is in there. And then you have the worst pandemic in more than a century, which scares the heck out of everybody yeah. who are watching what's happening and, and seeing people die. And it's bound to drive us even further into states of fear and anxiety that further highlights our divisions. But here's where Christians, it seems to me, are in the best possible place mm. to try to turn this around. We do not have a spirit of fear, uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. We have a, a spirit of self-control. We are actually people of truth. We are people of love. Mm. We're not just supposed to love our neighbors, which is hard enough right now. We're supposed to love our enemies. If we could bring a lot of the Sermon on the Mount back into what we're doing for society, yeah. maybe there is a chance here of trying to deal with what is otherwise a terrible yawning gap between so many uh, of our own people uh, that keeps families from even having conversations and friendships <laughs> broken yeah. apart because of a disagreement about politics. Hmm. Heartbreak. You mentioned the family thing. You see it so much, and you see it with politics. But COVID was one of those moments that amplified it in just fascinating ways. Families dividing mm -hmm. over, we're vaccinating, you know, oh, but we're not vaccinating, or we're not getting the booster, or we are getting the booster. And you saw families really clash and tear each other apart over it. And, and continue to. Yeah, Maybe to, not to this come day. Back together. And the whole thing about vaccines is particularly hard to understand how we got there. There's so much misinformation out there. The solid information about vaccines developed by those very large scale randomized controlled trials in 2020, 30,000 mm. participants with each vaccine. That's the data that is done in a way you can say what happened. 95% effective in preventing hospitalization and 100% preventing death at that point with that original virus. It's just an astoundingly positive result. Almost no vaccine does that well, and there it was. Mm -hmm. And yet, there are still people who don't accept that because of all the other stories that fly around from other sources. It has to feel a little disillusioning too, right? To have been I think the, the Trump administration referred to it as Operation Warp Speed. Mm -hmm. um, I was part of that. To be, you know, to be at the helm of this thing or to be you know, part of the leadership of this thing that does something truly unprecedented. You talk in the book about how getting a vaccine to market is like five years. Yeah. You do it in 11 months. It's extraordinarily effective. And then it becomes, and again, I'm thinking about you personally, it becomes this political dividing line. Bizarrely, Trump's own party even though Trump should take credit for he what should. he did. He should. Look what he did. Trump's own party turns against it. And because evangelicals are affiliated in a certain way there, like the, the evangelical community turns against it in certain circles. And it's not, again, evangelicalism is much more diverse than people give of us credit course. for, but nonetheless. What was that like, watching that? Did you expect it to be as polarizing as it was? I didn't. I, I thought... It was understandable during 2020 when we didn't know whether the vaccines were going to be any good for people to be skeptical about, mm -hmm. okay, you say that's going to do it, well, let's just see. And then there that was, there the data was, 
that night when the data was unblinded and we could see for the first time mm. what the results were, I was on my knees. I was so overwhelmed mm. uh, with gratitude, answers to prayer. I was supposed to speak. I couldn't. I just cried. Mm. And I thought, we finally have an answer and we're going to be able to do something about this terrible loss of life. But then it became clear over the coming months that that skepticism hadn't gone away. And it was tied into this general distrust mm -hmm. of what the government was up to. And 50 million Americans basically said no. And that's not a small proportion. Right. And was that 15%, something like that? Yeah. yeah. And the estimates that I've seen from nonpartisan groups like Kaiser Family Foundation is the result of that was devastating. Uh, that Almost a quarter million deaths. Almost a quarter million people died unnecessarily mm. because of the distrust of the vaccine. How could that happen? Mm -hmm. Each one of those in a grave somewhere that didn't need to be. And on top of that, lots of other things being spread around about how the vaccine itself was causing tens of thousands of deaths, totally made up data. Mm -hmm. And yet many people began to believe that and think, well, I'd better just take my chances. The mm -hmm. virus natural acquisition is probably safer than that terrible vaccine because maybe it also has fetal body parts or microchips. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the mark of the beast. <laughs> all, all of those went around. And I'm an evangelical Christian yeah. and to see this happening in my own tribe of fellow believers, I didn't see that coming. I'm part of Braver Angels, which is a mm -hmm. group uh, across America, 100 chapters now in various parts of the country, trying to bring people together who are very strongly disagreeing about something, and usually on a political basis. Maybe it's public health, maybe it's gun control, maybe it's mm -hmm. immigration, and ask them to actually listen to each other, not just shout. And in the process of listening, to try to really understand, where is that person coming from? They're not evil. This is a good, honorable person. They've arrived at this position because of other things that have led them to think that's the right answer. Let me try to understand that. I've learned a lot that way from mm -hmm. talking to, for instance, people from the middle of the country for whom the COVID restrictions about things like businesses and schools did not seem to fit uh, yeah. the existence they were having. We should have had something much more specialized and individualized instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, but we didn't have the time to do so. And a lot of hurt happened as a result of that. But you know what happens in those Braver Angel sessions when things really start to make progress is somebody says, I made a mistake. Hmm. Let me tell you the mistake I made. And then everybody else starts to stand back and go, well, you know, maybe I did too. Because you can't get to a place where we are right now, where things are so polarized, so divided, can't even agree about facts, unless we're all making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And if we could stop being so defensive and begin to get back in a place of listening to each other and then gradually recognizing the mistakes we've all made and finding our common ground. We're not going to agree on anything. We never have. We're Americans, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But we haven't demonized everybody yeah. like we are now. Yeah. Jonah Goldberg has this great line where he says, the structure of our government is not designed to make us all agree. It's designed to help us figure out how do we disagree, right? And I think when you look at the polarizations, the energizing force behind the polarization so often is we have to win. Yeah. And it's an all or nothing yes. culture war kind it, of thing. It, it. That's ultimately destructive to society. Like this idea that you're going to, whether it's like, oh, we're going to in institute like our Christian nationalist sh version of Sharia or whatever, or, you know, we're going to become like a progressive utopia because we're all going to yeah. embrace this sort of wild left-wing ideology. That brinksmanship is, is, seems to be the most destructive thing in our moment. And there's a lot of that. There's a rule by a social scientist named Sunstein that when you get people together around mm -hmm. a common issue that's sort of... Um, uh, hotly debated, uh, but they agree about it. The more they are agreeing about it and talking to each other, the more extreme they get. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you see when you have these tribal alliances over to one side or the other. They further inflame each other's sense of being embattled, under attack, and we have to win. And those people over there have to lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a wonderful New Yorker 
cartoon that I always think of. There's a, there's a bar scene and there are two dogs talking to each other in their nice three-piece suits over martinis. <laughs> and one says to the other, it's not enough for the dogs to win. <laughs> the cats have to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that one. <laughs> that seems like that's where we are. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this question. Let me let me put it to you. This question that Braver Angels asks: mm. What did you do that made things worse, and that you now regret? Yeah. As you think about your leadership at the NIH during this season, what did you do that made things worse, and what do you regret? So I was part of the effort to communicate with people about what was happening and what they should do about it. So there were many times where that van would pull up in front of my house and I would run out the front door and jump inside with a camera pointed at me and try to say something about what we had just learned about this pandemic. And I knew at the time when I was putting forward those messages uh, that there was a lot of uncertainty, but I didn't often say so. Now, mm. admittedly, you usually get this 20 second soundbite, but I should have said almost every time, look, this is the best we can do right now. I'm going to tell you what I think mm -hmm. are the right answers based on all the experts uh, that have been looking at this, but we might be wrong. So mm -hmm. don't be surprised if in another two weeks or two months, we have to say that wasn't it. We're going to do something different. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. I should have said it every time. And mm -hmm. so that contributed, I think, to people's inability right. to feel this was trustworthy. Yeah. Yeah, I think people wanted the comfort of tell us what to do, yeah. and we'll do it. And so you feel and like, oh, and then that's it's going to be all I better. Yeah. But as that changes, that creates that sense of uncertainty and mistrust. Yeah, right. And, yeah. It is interesting because if if you went to your stockbroker and said, mm -hmm. "What should I do with my investments today?" Mm -hmm. the stockbroker would give you their best estimate. Right. If you went back a month later and said, tell me what I should do with my investments today, and he told you exactly the same thing, you go, this guy's no good. <laughs> this is changing. But somehow that didn't apply yeah. in this, and it should have, in this situation, things mm -hmm. are changing. Mm -hmm. The answer is going to change. You want it to change. Otherwise, we're not doing our job. Mm. When you look at the future and you think about the next pandemic, oh, which you boy. say in the book, <laughs> you know, it's, you say in the book, like there will be another one, you know, this is, this is how these things go. What do you hope the next NIH director knows that you don't or I, didn't, I should say. Yeah. Um, I, I guess you can't tell them what you don't know. <laughs> I really don't know that we're very well set for this. Hmm. I mean, imagine that we do have an outbreak. Maybe the next time it's influenza. Oh, we're worried right now about this avian H5N1, suppose that suddenly does jump into humans and becomes highly contagious and we're back in a 1918 scene. Mm. There's no assurance that would not be possible. Yeah. And then, remember, this is a virus that is incredibly lethal to young people <laughs> as well as elderly. Which COVID wasn't. Which COVID was not. No. So it's even more of a threat. Can you imagine what would happen if... The recommendation is then, okay, everybody, you've got to stay at home, lock down the businesses and the schools. Mm -hmm. If you're outside for even a minute, you got to wear a mask. Those would be the right recommendations, mm -hmm. but who would listen? Mm -hmm. We've gotten ourselves so in this negative space. So I'm hopeful we will have some time <laughs> to get ready for whatever that next pandemic is going to be and try to figure out how can we, along the way, begin to pull our society back together right. in a healthier way, which is what the last chapter of my book is all about. Mm -hmm. Not just a diagnosis of the problems that we have, but what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. And particularly, how can Christians step in yeah. in a leadership role to heal our nation? Well, who's the book for? There's a group called More in Common that's kind of surveyed the nature of society uh, with a lot of data, and they would say, that the fringes on the left and the right, which is mostly what we hear about because they make news, <laughs> is actually not a very significant part of who we are. And there's at least two thirds of Americans who are not happy with those perspectives and they're called the exhausted middle. <laughs> That's who my book is for. Mm -hmm. And they're partly red and they're partly blue and they're partly believers and partly non-believers, but mm -hmm. they're just looking around going, what happened to us? <laughs> and how are we going to fix this? Yeah. And my exhortation is, we're going to fix it because we, the people, 
are going to decide to take charge of this. Don't count on the politicians to do it. They're pushing us, if anything, further apart. Don't count on the media. Certainly don't count on the social media. Yeah. It's up to us to basically step back from all of the animosity and all of the lies that are being spread around by people who are making money off of them mm -hmm. and basically say, okay, what is my worldview and how am I going to anchor it in things that are true mm -hmm. and loving and step aside from all of this other stuff. And that's hard work. You basically have to say, okay, what are the main things that I think are true? Okay, are they? <laughs> What's yeah. the evidence? And then how do I also begin as a person to begin to make relationships with other persons, other children of God who seem to be in a very different place than I am about a really contentious issue. Mm -hmm. And that means putting yourself out there, calling up somebody and saying, you know, we haven't talked in about a year because we have very different views about immigration, but I'd like mm -hmm. to understand where you're coming from. So mm -hmm. I want to listen to you. How about we go have coffee? Mm -hmm. And that takes some courage to do that. But I guarantee you, if somebody does that, they'll begin to realize there are serious reasons why this person has the view based on their experience, their particular set of values. And we can learn from that, each mm -hmm. of us. And pretty soon you'll find out, okay, you're going to disagree about this, but actually you have a lot in common. You both believe in freedom. You both believe in family mm -hmm. and faith and love and goodness and truth and beauty. Who's going to disagree about those? But we've lost track to those anchors as we've gone instead into these contentious areas. Mm -hmm. We can fix this, and we're the only people who can, I think, mm -hmm. person by person. And then see, can you build that into a community effort? That's what Braver Angels is trying to do. Join them. In the book, I'm urging people not just to say it sounds nice, but actually consider making a pledge. Mm -hmm. That's what we do sometimes when we're really serious. You make a pledge at your marriage, you make a pledge, I did as a college student, not to cheat on exams, all, all of those <laughs> pledges, they have a significance. If we could get a lot of us to basically pledge, I'm gonna try to be part of the solution. I'm gonna reach out to people who don't agree with me. I'm not gonna distribute information that might not be true. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna love my neighbor. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna be slow to take offense. That could make a difference. Yeah. Maybe it's the only thing that could make a difference. I want to commend you in what you've done with the book and what you've done in this conversation as well, and you've done it in a number of conversations. It is so rare in the moment that we're in mm -hmm. to hear people in positions of leadership saying, we got this wrong. And it's been refreshing, I would say, over the last year to have heard you in various places do that. And I think part of what's impressive about it is when we talk about this, where you'll say, look, I, I think we got this one right. Like this, the data says this, you know, we, we did this. I'm proud of this work. I'm proud of that. But being able to identify things and go, we probably got that one wrong or we did a poor job with the communication or whatever. It's so exceptionally rare. Christians in the public sphere, especially, have to be willing to do that. Yeah. And I think you've done that in the book. There's a vulnerability in the book as well, where you talk about moments that were embarrassing, that broke your heart. You share that on the page in a way that I just found very compelling. So I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for the book and really grateful for this conversation. Oh, thanks, Mike. It's been great to talk to you about all this. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's produced by Clarissa Mall. The associate producer is Leslie Thompson. This episode was mixed by TJ Hester, theme music by Dan Phelps. Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper are the executive producers of CT Media Podcasts, and Matt Stevens is our senior producer. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review to help more people find the show. Thanks for listening.